Chapters 61 and 62 of Don Quixote, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 2, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 61. Of what happened Don Quixote on entering Barcelona, together with other matters that partake of the true rather than of the ingenious. Don Quixote passed three days and three nights with Roque, and had he passed three hundred years, he would have found enough to observe and wonder at in his mode of life. At daybreak they were in one spot, at dinner-time in another. Sometimes they fled without knowing from whom, at other times they lay in wait, not knowing for what. They slept standing, breaking their slumbers to shift from place to place. There was nothing but sending out spies and scouts, posting sentinels and blowing the matches of arquebuses, though they carried but few, for almost all used flintlocks. Roque passed his nights in some place or other apart from his men, that they might not know where he was, for the many proclamations the viceroy of Barcelona had issued against his life kept him in fear and uneasiness, and he did not venture to trust any one, afraid that even his own men would kill him or deliver him up to the authorities of a truth a weary, miserable life. At length, by unfrequented roads, shortcuts, and secret paths, Roque, Don Quixote, and Sancho, together with six squires, set out for Barcelona. They reached the strand on St. John's Eve during the night, and Roque, after embracing Don Quixote and Sancho, to whom he presented the ten crowns he had promised but had not till then given, left them with many expressions of good will on both sides. Roque went back, while Don Quixote remained on horseback, just as he was, waiting for day, and it was not long before the countenance of the fair Aurora began to show itself at the balconies of the east, gladdening the grass and flowers, if not the ear, though to gladden that too there came at the same moment a sound of clarions and drums, and a din of bells, and a tramp-tramp and cries of, Clear the way there, of some runners, that seemed to issue from the city. The dawn made way for the sun that with a face broader than a buckler began to rise slowly above the low line of the horizon. Don Quixote and Sancho gazed all around them. They beheld the sea, a sight till then unseen by them. It struck them as exceedingly spacious and broad, much more so than the lakes of Ruidera, which they had seen in La Mancha. They saw the galleys along the beach, which, lowering their awnings, displayed themselves decked with streamers and pennons, that trembled in the breeze and kissed and swept the water, while on board the bugles, trumpets, and clarions were sounding and filling the air far and near with melodious warlike notes. Then they began to move and execute a kind of skirmish upon the calm water, while a vast number of horsemen on fine horses and in showy liveries, issuing from the city, engaged on their side in a somewhat similar movement. The soldiers on board the galleys kept up a ceaseless fire, which they on the walls and forts of the city returned, and the heavy cannon rent the air with a tremendous noise they made, to which the gangway guns of the galleys replied. The bright sea, the smiling earth, the clear air, though at times darkened by the smoke of the guns, all seemed to fill the whole multitude with unexpected delight. Sancho could not make out how it was that these great masses that moved over the sea had so many feet." and now the horsemen in livery came galloping up with shouts and outlandish cries and cheers to where Don Quixote stood amazed and wondering, and one of them, he to whom Roque had sent word, addressing him, exclaimed, Welcome to our city, mirror, beacon, star, and cynosure of all knight errantry in its widest extent. Welcome, I say, valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha, not the false, the fictitious, the apocryphal, that these latter days have offered us in lying histories, but the true, the legitimate, the real one that Sidi Amete Benengeli, flower of historians, has described to us. Don Quixote made no answer, nor did the horsemen wait for one, but wheeling again with all their followers, they began curvetting around Don Quixote, who, turning to Sancho, said, These gentlemen have plainly recognized us. I will wager they have read our history, and even that newly printed one by the Aragonese. The cavalier who had addressed Don Quixote again approached him and said, Come with us, Señor Don Quixote, for we are all of us your servants and great friends of Roque Guinart's. To which Don Quixote returned, If courtesy breeds courtesy, yours, Sir Knight, is daughter or very nearly akin to the great Roque's. Carry me where you please. 
I will have no will but yours, especially if you deign to employ it in your service. The cavalier replied with words no less polite, and then, all closing in around him, they set out with him for the city, to the music of the clarions and the drums. As they were entering it, the wicked one, who is the author of all mischief, and the boys who are wickeder than the wicked one, contrived that a couple of these audacious, irrepressible urchins should force their way through the crowd, and lifting up one of them Dapple's tail and the other Rocinante's, insert a bunch of furs under each. The poor beasts felt the strange spurs and added to their anguish by pressing their tails tight, so much so that, cutting a multitude of capers, they flung their masters to the ground. Don Quixote, covered with shame and out of countenance, ran to pluck the plume from the poor jade's tail, while Sancho did the same for Dapple. His conductors tried to punish the audacity of the boys, but there was no possibility of doing so, for they hid themselves among the hundreds of others that were following them. Don Quixote and Sancho mounted once more, and with the same music and acclamations reached their conductor's house, which was large and stately, that of a rich gentleman in short. And there for the present we will leave them, for such is Cide Amete's pleasure. Chapter 62 Which deals with the adventure of the enchanted head, together with other trivial matters which cannot be left untold. Don Quixote's host was one Don Antonio Moreno by name, a gentleman of wealth and intelligence, and very fond of diverting himself in any fair and good-natured way, and having Don Quixote in his house, he set about devising modes of making him exhibit his mad points in some harmless fashion, for jests that give pain are no jests, and no sport is worth anything if it hurts another. The first thing he did was to make Don Quixote take off his armor, and lead him in that tight chamois suit we have already described and depicted more than once, out on a balcony overhanging one of the chief streets of the city, in full view of the crowd and of the boys, who gazed at him as they would at a monkey. The cavaliers in livery careered before him again as though it were for him alone, and not to enliven the festival of the day, that they wore it, and Sancho was in high delight, for it seemed to him that, how he knew not, he had fallen upon another Camacho's wedding, another house like Don Diego de Miranda's, another castle like the Duke's. Some of Don Antonio's friends dined with him that day, and all showed honor to Don Quixote and treated him as a knight-errant, and he, becoming puffed up and exalted in consequence, could not contain himself for satisfaction. Such were the drolleries of Sancho that all the servants of the house, and all who heard him, were kept hanging upon his lips. While at table Don Antonio said to him, We hear, worthy Sancho, that you are so fond of manjar blanco and forced meat-balls, that if you have any left, you keep them in your bosom for the next day. No, senor, that's not true, said Sancho, for I am more cleanly than greedy, and my master Don Quixote here knows well that we two are used to live for a week on a handful of acorns or nuts. To be sure, if it so happens that they offer me a heifer, I run with a halter. I mean, I eat what I'm given, and make use of opportunities as I find them. But whoever says that I'm an out-of-the-way eater, or not cleanly, let me tell him that he is wrong, and I'd put it in a different way if I did not respect the honorable beards that are at the table. Indeed, said Don Quixote, Sancho's moderation and cleanliness in eating might be inscribed and graved on plates of brass to be kept in eternal remembrance in ages to come. It is true that when he is hungry there is a certain appearance of veracity about him, for he eats at a great pace and chews with both jaws, but cleanliness he is always mindful of and when he was governor he learned how to eat daintily, so much so that he eats grapes and even pomegranate pips with a fork. What, said Don Antonio, has Sancho been a governor? Ay, said Sancho, and of an island called Barataria. I governed it to perfection for ten days, and lost my rest all the time, and learned to look down upon all the governments in the world. I got out of it by taking to flight, and fell into a pit where I gave myself up for dead, and out of which I escaped alive by a miracle. Don Quixote then gave them a minute account of the whole affair of Sancho's government, with which he greatly amused his hearers. On the cloth being removed, Don Antonio, taking Don Quixote by the hand, passed with him into a distant room in which there was nothing in the way of furniture except a table, apparently of jasper, resting on a pedestal of the same, upon which was set up, after the fashion of the busts of the Roman emperors, a head which seemed to be of bronze. 
Don Antonio traversed the whole apartment with Don Quixote, and walked around the table several times, and then said, Now, Señor Don Quixote, that I am satisfied that no one is listening to us, and that the door is shut, I will tell you one of the rarest adventures, or more properly speaking, strange things, that can be imagined, on condition that you will keep what I say to you in the remotest recesses of secrecy. I swear it, said Don Quixote, and for greater security I will put a flagstone over it, for I would have you know, Señor Don Antonio, he had by this time learned his name, that you are addressing one who, though he has ears to hear, has no tongue to speak, so that you may safely transfer whatever you have in your bosom into mine, and rely upon it that you have consigned it to the depths of silence. In reliance upon that promise, said Don Antonio, I will astonish you with what you shall see and hear, and relieve myself of some of the vexation it gives me to have no one to whom I can confide my secrets, for they are not of a sort to be entrusted to everybody. Don Quixote was puzzled, wondering what could be the object of such precautions, whereupon Don Antonio, taking his hand, passed it over the bronze head and the whole table and pedestal of jasper on which it stood, and then said, This head, Señor Don Quixote, has been made and fabricated by one of the greatest magicians and wizards the world ever saw, a pole, I believe, by birth, and a pupil of the famous Escotillo, of whom such marvellous stories are told. He was here in my house, and for a consideration of a thousand crowns that I gave him, he constructed this head, which has the property and virtue of answering whatever questions are put to its ear. He observed the points of the compass, he traced figures, he studied the stars, he watched favourable moments, and at length brought it to the perfection we shall see to-morrow, for on Fridays it is mute, and this being Friday, we must wait till the next day. In the interval, your worship may consider what you would like to ask it, and I know by experience that in all its answers it tells the truth. Don Quixote was amazed at the virtue and property of the head, and was inclined to disbelieve Don Antonio, but seeing what a short time he had to wait to test the matter, he did not choose to say anything except that he thanked him for having revealed to him so mighty a secret. They then quitted the room, Don Antonio locked the door, and they repaired to the chamber where the rest of the gentlemen were assembled. In the meantime Sancho had recounted to them several of the adventures and accidents that had happened his master. That afternoon they took Don Quixote out for a stroll, not in his armor but in street costume, with a surcoat of tawny cloth upon him that at that season would have made ice itself sweat. Orders were left with the servants to entertain Sancho so as not to let him leave the house. Don Quixote was mounted, not on Rocinante, but upon a tall mule of easy pace and handsomely caparisoned. They put the surcoat on him, and on the back, without his perceiving it, they stitched a parchment on which they wrote in large letters, This is Don Quixote of La Mancha. As they set out upon their excursion, the placard attracted the eyes of all who chanced to see him, and as they read out, this is Don Quixote of La Mancha. Don Quixote was amazed to see how many people gazed at him, called him by his name, and recognized him, and turning to Don Antonio, who rode at his side, he observed to him, Great are the privileges knight-errantry involves, for it makes him who professes it known and famous in every region of the earth. See, Don Antonio, even the very boys of this city know me without ever having seen me. True, Señor Don Quixote, returned Don Antonio, for as fire cannot be hidden or kept secret, virtue cannot escape being recognized, and that which is attained by the profession of arms shines distinguished above all others. It came to pass, however, that as Don Quixote was proceeding amid the acclamations that have been described, a Castilian, reading the inscription on his back, cried out in a loud voice, The devil take thee for a Don Quixote of La Mancha! What, art thou here and not dead of the countless drubbings that have fallen on thy ribs? Thou art mad, and if thou wert so by thyself, and kept thyself within thy madness, it would not be so bad. But thou hast the gift of making fools and blockheads of all who have anything to do with thee or say to thee. Why, look at these gentlemen bearing thee company. Get thee home, blockhead, and see after thy affairs, and thy wife and children, and give over these fooleries that are sapping thy brains and skimming away thy wits. Go your own way, brother, said Don Antonio and don't offer advice to those who don't ask you for it. Señor Don Quixote is in his full senses, and we who bear him company are not fools. Virtue is to be honored wherever it may be found. Go, and bad luck to you, and don't meddle where you are not wanted. 
By God, your worship is right, replied the Castilian, for to advise this good man is to kick against the pricks, still for all that it fills me with pity that the sound wit they say the blockhead has in everything should dribble away by the channel of his knight errantry. But may the bad luck your worship talks of follow me and all my descendants, if, from this day forth, though I should live longer than Methuselah, I ever give advice to anybody even if he asks me for it. The advice-giver took himself off, and they continued their stroll, but so great was the press of the boys and people to read the placard, that Don Antonio was forced to remove it as if he were taking off something else. Night came, and they went home, and there was a ladies' dancing party, for Don Antonio's wife, a lady of rank and gaiety, beauty and wit, had invited some friends of hers to come and do honor to her guest, and amuse themselves with his strange delusions. Several of them came, they supped sumptuously, the dance began at about ten o'clock. Among the ladies were two of a mischievous and frolicsome turn, and though perfectly modest, somewhat free in playing tricks for harmless diversion's sake. These two were so indefatigable in taking Don Quixote out to dance, that they tired him down, not only in body, but in spirit. It was a sight to see the figure Don Quixote made, long, lank, lean, and yellow, his garments clinging tight to him, ungainly, and above all anything but agile. The gay ladies made secret love to him, and he on his part secretly repelled them, but finding himself hard-pressed by their blandishments, he lifted up his voice and exclaimed, Fugite, partes adversae! Leave me in peace, unwelcome overtures! Avant with your desires, ladies, for she who is queen of mine, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso, suffers none but hers to lead me captive and subdue me. And so saying, he sat down on the floor in the middle of the room, tired out and broken down by all this exertion in the dance. Don Antonio directed him to be taken up bodily and carried to bed, and the first that laid hold of him was Sancho, saying as he did so, In an evil hour you took to dancing, master mine. Do you fancy all mighty men of valor are dancers, and all knights errant given to capering? If you do, I can tell you you are mistaken. There's many a man would rather undertake to kill a giant than cut a caper. If it had been the shoe-fling you were at, I could take your place, for I can do the shoe-fling like a gerfalcon. But I'm no good at dancing." With these and other observations, Sancho set the whole ballroom laughing, and then put his master to bed, covering him up well so that he might sweat out any chill cot after his dancing. The next day Don Antonio thought he might as well make trial of the enchanted head, and with Don Quixote, Sancho, and two others, friends of his, besides the two ladies that had tired out Don Quixote at the ball, who had remained for the night with Don Antonio's wife, he locked himself up in the chamber where the head was. He explained to them the property it possessed, and entrusted the secret to them, telling them that now, for the first time, he was going to try the virtue of the enchanted head. But except Don Antonio's two friends, no one else was privy to the mystery of the enchantment, and if Don Antonio had not first revealed it to them, they would have been inevitably reduced to the same state of amazement as the rest, so artfully and skillfully was it contrived. The first to approach the ear of the head was Don Antonio himself, and in a low voice, but not so low as not to be audible to all, he said to it, Head, tell me by the virtue that lies in thee, what am I at this moment thinking of? The head, without any movement of the lips, answered in a clear and distinct voice, so as to be heard by all, I cannot judge of thoughts. All were thunderstruck at this, and all the more so as they saw that there was nobody anywhere near the table, or in the whole room that could have answered. How many of us are here? asked Don Antonio once more, and it was answered him in the same way softly, Thou and thy wife, with two friends of thine and two of hers, and a famous knight called Don Quixote of La Mancha, and a squire of his, Sancho Panza by name. Now there was fresh astonishment, now every one's hair was standing on end with awe, and Don Antonio, retiring from the head, exclaimed, This suffices to show me that I have not been deceived by him who sold thee to me, O sage head, talking head, answering head, wonderful head. Let some one else go and put what question he likes to it. And as women are commonly impulsive and inquisitive, the first to come forward was one of the two friends of Don Antonio's wife, and her question was, Tell me, head, what shall I do to be very beautiful? And the answer she got was, Be very modest. I question thee no further, said the fair queerest. Her companion then came up and said, I should like to know, Head, 
whether my husband loves me or not? The answer given to her was, Think how he uses thee, and thou mayest guess. And the married lady went off saying, That answer did not need a question, for of course the treatment one receives shows the disposition of him from whom it is received. Then one of Don Antonio's two friends advanced and asked it, Who am I? Thou knowest, was the answer. That is not what I ask thee, said the gentleman, but to tell me if thou knowest me. Yes, I know thee, thou art Don Pedro Noris, was the reply. I do not seek to know more, said the gentleman, for this is enough to convince me, O head, that thou knowest everything. And as he retired, the other friend came forward and asked it, Tell me, head, what are the wishes of my eldest son? I have said already, was the answer, that I cannot judge of wishes. However, I can tell thee the wish of thy son is to bury thee. That's what I see with my eyes I point out with my finger, said the gentleman, so I ask no more. Don Antonio's wife came up and said, I know not what to ask thee, head. I would only seek to know of thee if I shall have many years of enjoyment of my good husband. And the answer she received was, Thou shalt, for his vigor and his temperate habits promise many years of life, which by their intemperance others so often cut short. Then Don Quixote came forward and asked, Tell me, thou that answerest, was that which I describe as having happened to me in the cave of Montesinos the truth or a dream? Will Sancho's whipping be accomplished without fail? Will the disenchantment of Dulcinea be brought about? As to the question of the cave, was the reply, there is much to be said, there is something of both in it. Sancho's whipping will proceed leisurely. The disenchantment of Dulcinea will attain its due consummation. I seek to know no more, said Don Quixote. Let me but see Dulcinea disenchanted, and I will consider that all the good fortune I could wish for has come upon me all at once. The last questioner was Sancho, and his questions were, Head, shall I by any chance have another government? Shall I ever escape from the hard life of a squire? Shall I get back to see my wife and children? To which the answer came, Thou shalt govern in thy house, and if thou returnest to it, thou shalt see thy wife and children, and on ceasing to serve, thou shalt cease to be a squire. Good, by God, said Sancho Panza, I could have told myself that. The prophet Perogulo could have said no more. What answer wouldst thou have, beast? said Don Quixote. Is it not enough that the replies this head has given suit the questions put to it? Yes, it is enough, said Sancho but I should have liked it to have made itself plainer and told me more. The questions and answers came to an end here, but not the wonder with which all were filled, except Don Antonio's two friends, who were in the secret. This Cide Amete Benengeli thought fit to reveal at once, not to keep the world in suspense, fancying that the head had some strange magical mystery in it. He says, therefore, that on the model of another head, the work of an image-maker, which he had seen at Madrid, Don Antonio made this one at home for his own amusement and to astonish ignorant people, and its mechanism was as follows. The table was of wood, painted and varnished to imitate jasper, and the pedestal on which it stood was of the same material, with four eagle's claws projecting from it to support the weight more steadily. The head, which resembled a bust or figure of a Roman emperor, and was colored like bronze, was hollow throughout, as was the table, into which it was fitted so exactly that no trace of the joining was visible. The pedestal of the table was also hollow, and communicated with the throat and neck of the head, and the whole was in communication with another room underneath the chamber in which the head stood. Through the entire cavity in the pedestal, table, throat, and neck of the buster figure, there passed a tube of tin carefully adjusted and concealed from sight. In the room below, corresponding to the one above, was placed the person who was to answer, with his mouth to the tube, and the voice as in an ear-trumpet passed from above downwards and from below upwards, the words coming clearly and distinctly. It was impossible thus to detect the trick. A nephew of Don Antonio's, a smart sharp-witted student, was the answerer, and as he had been told beforehand by his uncle who the persons were that would come with him that day into the chamber where the head was, it was an easy matter for him to answer the first question at once and correctly. The others he answered by guesswork, and, being clever, cleverly. See, they Amete adds that this marvellous contrivance stood for some ten or twelve days, but that, as it became noised abroad through the city that he had in his house an enchanted head that answered all who asked questions of it, 
Don Antonio, fearing it might come to the ears of the watchful sentinels of our faith, explained the matter to the inquisitors, who commanded him to break it up and have done with it, lest the ignorant vulgar should be scandalized. By Don Quixote, however, and by Sancho, the head was still held to be an enchanted one, and capable of answering questions, though more to Don Quixote's satisfaction than Sancho's. The gentlemen of the city, to gratify Don Antonio, and also to do the honors to Don Quixote, and give him an opportunity of displaying his folly, made arrangements for a tilting at the ring in six days from that time, which, however, for reason that will be mentioned hereafter, did not take place. Don Quixote took a fancy to stroll about the city quietly and on foot, for he feared that if he went on horseback the boys would follow him, so he and Sancho and two servants that Don Antonio gave him set out for a walk. Thus it came to pass that going along one of the streets, Don Quixote lifted up his eyes and saw written in very large letters over a door, books printed here, at which he was vastly pleased, for until then he had never seen a printing office, and he was curious to know what it was like. He entered with all his following, and saw them drawing sheets in one place, correcting in another, setting up type here, revising there, in short, all the work that is to be seen in great printing offices. He went up to one case and asked what they were about there. The workmen told him. He watched them with wonder and passed on. He approached one man, among others, and asked him what he was doing. The workmen replied, Senor, this gentleman here, pointing to a man of prepossessing appearance and a certain gravity of look, has translated an Italian book into our Spanish tongue, and I am setting it up in type for the press. What is the title of the book? asked Don Quixote, to which the author replied, Senor, in Italian the book is called Le Bagatelle. And what does Le Bagatelle import in our Spanish? asked Don Quixote. Le Bagatelle, said the author, is as though we should say in Spanish Los Juguetes. But though the book is humble in name, it has good solid matter in it. I, said Don Quixote, have some little smattering of Italian, and I plume myself on singing some of Ariosto's stanzas. But tell me, senor, I do not say this to test your ability, but merely out of curiosity, have you ever met with the word pignata in your book? Yes, often, said the author. And how do you render that in Spanish? How should I render it, returned the author, but by olla? Body a me, exclaimed Don Quixote, what a proficient you are in the Italian language. I would lay a good wager that where they say in Italian piace, you say in Spanish place and where they say pew, you say mas, and you translate su by arriba, and gu by abajo. I translate them so, of course, said the author, for those are their proper equivalents. I would venture to swear, said Don Quixote, that your worship is not known in the world, which always begrudges their reward to rare wits and praiseworthy labors. What talents lie wasted there? What genius thrust away into corners? What worth left neglected? Still it seems to me that translation from one language to another, if it be not from the queens of languages, the Greek and the Latin, is like looking at Flemish tapestries on the wrong side. For though the figures are visible, they are full of threads that make them indistinct, and they do not show with the smoothness and brightness of the right side. And translation from easy languages argues neither ingenuity nor command of words, any more than transcribing or copying out one document from another but I do not mean by this to draw the inference that no credit is to be allowed for the work of translating, for a man may employ himself in ways worse and less profitable to himself. This estimate does not include two famous translators, Dr. Cristobal de Figueroa, in his Pastor Fido, and Don Juan de Huaregui, in his Aminta, wherein by their felicity they leave it in doubt which is the translation and which the original." But tell me, are you printing this book at your own risk, or have you sold the copyright to some bookseller? I print at my own risk, said the author, and I expect to make a thousand ducats at least by this first edition, which is to be of two thousand copies that will go off in a twinkling at six reals apiece. A fine calculation you are making, said Don Quixote. It is plain you don't know the ins and outs of the printers, and how they play into one another's hands. I promise you when you find yourself saddled with two thousand copies, you will feel so sore that it will astonish you, particularly if the book is little out of the common, and not in any way highly spiced. What, said the author, would your worship then have me give it to a bookseller who will give me three maravedis for the copyright, and think he is doing me a favor? 
I do not print my books to win fame in the world, for I am known in it already by my works. I want to make money, without which reputation is not worth a rap. God send your worship good luck, said Don Quixote, and he moved on to another case, where he saw them correcting a sheet of a book with the title of Light of the Soul. Noticing it, he observed, Books like this, though there are many of the kind, are the ones that deserve to be printed, for many are the sinners in these days, and lights unnumbered are needed for all that are in darkness. He passed on and saw that they were also correcting another book, and when he asked its title they told him it was called The Second Part of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by one of Tordesillas. I have heard of this book already, said Don Quixote, and verily and on my conscience I thought it had been by this time burned to ashes as a meddlesome intruder. But its Martinmas will come to it as it does to every pig for fictions have the more merit and charm about them, the more nearly they approach the truth or what looks like it. And true stories, the truer they are, the better they are. And so saying, he walked out of the printing office with a certain amount of displeasure in his looks. That same day Don Antonio arranged to take him to see the galleys that lay at the beach, whereat Sancho was in high delight, as he had never seen any all his life. Don Antonio sent word to the commandant of the galleys that he intended to bring his guest, the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, of whom the commandant and all the citizens had already heard, that afternoon to see them, and what happened on board of them will be told in the next chapter. End of chapter 62three and sixty four of Don Quixote, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume Two, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by William Ormsby, Chapter sixty three, of the mishap that befell Sancho Panza through the visit to the galleys, and the strange adventure of the fair Morisco. Profound were Don Quixote's reflections on the reply of the enchanted head, not one of them, however, hitting on the secret of the trick, but all concentrated on the promise, which he regarded as a certainty, of Dulcinea's disenchantment. This he turned over in his mind again and again with great satisfaction, fully persuaded that he would shortly see its fulfillment, and as for Sancho, though, as has been said, he hated being a governor, Still he had a longing to be giving orders, and finding himself obeyed once more. This is the misfortune that being in authority, even in jest, brings with it. To resume, that afternoon their host Don Antonio Moreno and his two friends, with Don Quixote and Sancho, went to the galleys. The commandant had been already made aware of his good fortune in seeing two such famous persons as Don Quixote and Sancho, and the instant they came to the shore, all the galleys struck their awnings and the clarions rang out. A skiff covered with rich carpets and cushions of crimson velvet was immediately lowered into the water, and as Don Quixote stepped on board of it, the leading galley fired her gangway gun, and the other galleys did the same. And as he mounted the starboard ladder, the whole crew saluted him, as is the custom when a personage of distinction comes on board a galley, by exclaiming, Hoo, 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 three times. The general, for so we shall call him, a Valencian gentleman of rank, gave him his hand and embraced him, saying, I shall mark this day with a white stone as one of the happiest I can expect to enjoy in my lifetime, since I have seen Señor Don Quixote of La Mancha, pattern and image wherein we see contained and condensed all that is worthy in knight-errantry. Don Quixote delighted beyond measure with such a lordly reception, replied to him in words no less courteous. All then proceeded to the poop, which was very handsomely decorated, and seated themselves on the bulwark benches. The boatswain passed along the gangway and piped all hands to strip, which they did in an instant. Sancho, seeing such a number of men stripped to the skin, was taken aback, and still more when he saw them spread the awning so briskly that it seemed to him as if all the devils were at work at it. But all this was cakes and fancy bread to what I am going to tell now. Sancho was seated on the captain's stage, close to the aftermost rower on the right-hand side. He, previously instructed in what he was to do, laid hold of Sancho, hoisting him up in his arms, and the whole crew, who were standing ready, beginning on the right, 
proceeded to pass him on, whirling him along from hand to hand and from bench to bench, with such rapidity that it took the sight out of poor Sancho's eyes, and he made quite sure that the devils themselves were flying away with him. Nor did they leave off with him until they had sent him back along the left side and deposited him on the poop and the poor fellow was left bruised and breathless and all in a sweat, and unable to comprehend what it was that had happened to him. Don Quixote, when he saw Sancho's flight without wings, asked the general if this was a usual ceremony with those who came on board the galleys for the first time, for, if so, as he had no intention of adopting them as a profession, he had no mind to perform such feats of agility, and if any one offered to lay hold of him to whirl him about, he vowed to God he would kick his soul out, and as he said this he stood up and clapped his hand upon his sword. At this instant they struck the awning and lowered the yard with a prodigious rattle. Sancho thought heaven was coming off its hinges and going to fall on his head, and full of terror he ducked it and buried it between his knees. Nor were Don Quixote's knees altogether under control, for he too shook a little, squeezed his shoulders together, and lost color. The crew then hoisted the yard with the same rapidity and clatter as when they lowered it, all the while keeping silence as though they had neither voice nor breath. The bosun gave the signal to weigh anchor, and leaping upon the middle of the gangway, began to lay on to the shoulders of the crew with his corbash or whip, and to haul out gradually to sea. When Sancho saw so many red feet, for such he took the oars to be, moving all together, he said to himself, It's these that are the real chanted things, and not the ones my master talks of. What can those wretches have done to be so whipped, and how does that one man who goes along there whistling dare to whip so many? I declare this is hell, or at least purgatory. Don Quixote, observing how attentively Sancho regarded what was going on, said to him, Ah, Sancho, my friend, how quickly and cheaply might you finish off the disenchantment of Dulcinea, if you would strip to the waist and take your place among those gentlemen." amid the pain and sufferings of so many, you would not feel your own much. And moreover, perhaps the sage Merlin would allow each of these lashes, being laid on with a good hand, to count for ten of those which you must give yourself at last. The general was about to ask what these lashes were, and what was Dulcinea's disenchantment, when a sailor exclaimed, Mojui signals that there is an oared vessel off the coast to the west. On hearing this, the general sprang upon the gangway, crying, now then, my sons, don't let her give us the slip. It must be some Algerine corsair brigantine that the watchtower signals to us. The three others immediately came alongside the chief galley to receive their orders. The general ordered two to be put out to sea, while he with the other kept in shore, so that in this way the vessel could not escape them. The crews plied the oars driving the galleys so furiously that they seemed to fly. The two that had put out to sea, after a couple of miles, sighted a vessel which, so far as they could make out, they judged to be one of fourteen or fifteen banks, and so she proved. As soon as the vessel discovered the galleys, she went about with the object and in the hope of making her escape by her speed, but the attempt failed, for the chief galley was one of the fastest vessels afloat, and overhauled her so rapidly that they on board the brigantine saw clearly there was no possibility of escaping, and the reese therefore would have had them drop their oars and give themselves up, so as not to provoke the captain in command of our galleys to anger. But chance, directing things otherwise, so ordered it that just as the chief galley came close enough for those on board the vessel to hear the shouts from her calling on them to surrender, two Torakis, that is to say two Turks, both drunken, that with a dozen more were on board the brigantine, discharged their muskets, killing two of the soldiers that lined the sides of our vessel. Seeing this, the general swore that he would not leave one of those he found on board the vessel alive, but as he bore down furiously upon her, she slipped away from him underneath the oars. The galley shot a good way ahead. Those on board the vessel saw their case was desperate, and while the galley was coming about they made sail, and by sailing and rowing once more tried to sheer off. But their activity did not do them as much good as their rashness did them harm, for the galley coming up with them in a little more than half a mile threw her oars over them and took the whole of them alive. The other two galleys now joined company, and all four returned with the prize to the beach, where a vast multitude stood waiting for them, eager to see what they brought back. The general anchored close in, and perceived that the viceroy of the city was on the shore. He ordered the skiff to push off to fetch him, 
and the yard to be lowered for the purpose of hanging forthwith the reese and the rest of the men taken on board the vessel, about six and thirty in number, all smart fellows, and most of them Turkish musketeers. He asked which was the reese of the brigantine, and was answered in Spanish by one of the prisoners, who afterwards proved to be a Spanish renegade, This young man, senor, that you see here is our reese, and he pointed to one of the handsomest and most gallant-looking youths that could be imagined. He did not seem to be twenty years of age. Tell me, dog, said the general, what led thee to kill my soldiers when thou sawest it was impossible for thee to escape? Is that the way to behave to chief galleys? Knowest thou not that rashness is not valor? Faint prospects of success should make men bold, but not rash. The reese was about to reply, but the general could not at that moment listen to him, as he had to hasten to receive the viceroy, who was now coming on board the galley, and with him certain of his attendants and some of the people. "'You have had a good chase, Signor General,' said the viceroy. "'Your Excellency shall soon see how good, by the game strung up to this yard,' replied the general. "'How so?' returned the viceroy. "'Because,' said the general, "'against all law, reason, and usages of war, they have killed on my hands two of my best soldiers on board these galleys, and I have sworn to hang every man that I have taken, but above all this youth who is the reese of the brigantine, and he pointed to him as he stood with his hands already bound and the rope around his neck, ready for death. The viceroy looked at him, and seeing him so well favored, so graceful and so submissive, he felt a desire to spare his life, the comeliness of the youth furnishing him at once with a letter of recommendation. He therefore questioned him, saying, Tell me, Reese, art thou Turk, Moor, or Renegade? To which the youth replied, also in Spanish, I am neither Turk, nor Moor, nor Renegade. What art thou, then? said the viceroy. A Christian woman, replied the youth. A woman and a Christian, in such dress and in such circumstances. It is more marvellous than credible, said the viceroy. Suspend the execution of the sentence, said the youth. Your vengeance will not lose much by waiting while I tell you the story of my life. What heart could be so hard as not to be softened by these words, at any rate so far as to listen to what the unhappy youth had to say? The general bade him say what he pleased, but not to expect pardon for his flagrant offense. With this permission the youth began in these words. Born of Morisco parents, I am of that nation more unhappy than wise, upon which of late a sea of woes has poured down. In the course of our misfortune I was carried to Barbary by two uncles of mine, for it was in vain that I declared I was Christian, as in fact I am, and not a mere pretended one, or outwardly, but a true Catholic Christian. It availed me nothing with those charged with our sad expatriation to protest this, nor would my uncles believe it. On the contrary, they treated it as an untruth and a subterfuge set up to enable me to remain behind in the land of my birth and so, more by force than of my own will, they took me with them. I had a Christian mother, and a father who was a man of sound sense, and a Christian too. I imbibed the Catholic faith with my mother's milk. I was well brought up, and neither in word nor in deed did I, I think, show any sign of being a Morisco. To accompany these virtues, for such I hold them, my beauty, if I possess any, grew with my growth and great as was the seclusion in which I lived, it was not so great but that a young gentleman, Don Gaspar Gregorio by name, eldest son of a gentleman who was lord of a village near ours, contrived to find opportunities of seeing me. How he saw me, how we met, how his heart was lost to me, and mine not kept from him, would take too long to tell, especially in a moment when I am in dread of the cruel cord that threatens me interposing between tongue and throat. I will only say, therefore, that Don Gregorio chose to accompany me in our banishment. He joined company with the Moriscos, who were going forth from other villages, for he knew their language very well, and on the voyage he struck up a friendship with my two uncles, who were carrying me with them. For my father, like a wise and far-sighted man, as soon as he heard the first edict for our expulsion, quitted the village and departed in quest of some refuge for us abroad. He left hidden and buried, at a spot of which I alone have knowledge, a large quantity of pearls and precious stones of great value, together with a sum of money in gold crusados and doubloons. He charged me on no account to touch the treasure, if by any chance they expelled us before his return. I obeyed him, and with my uncles, as I have said, and others of our kindred and neighbors, passed over to Barbary, 
and the place where we took up our abode was Algiers, much the same as if we had taken it up in hell itself. The king heard of my beauty, and report told him of my wealth, which was in some degree fortunate for me. He summoned me before him, and asked me what part of Spain I came from, and what money and jewels I had. I mentioned the place, and told him the jewels and the money were buried there, but that they might easily be recovered if I myself went back for them. All this I told him, in dread, lest my beauty and not his own covetousness should influence him. While he was engaged in conversation with me, they brought him word that in company with me was one of the handsomest and most graceful youths that could be imagined. I knew at once that they were speaking of Don Gaspar Gregorio, whose comeliness surpasses the most highly vaunted beauty. I was troubled when I thought of the danger he was in, for among those barbarous Turks a fair youth is more esteemed than a woman, be she ever so beautiful. The king immediately ordered him to be brought before him that he might see him, and asked me if what they said about the youth was true. I then, almost as if inspired by heaven, told him it was, but that I would have him to know it was not a man, but a woman like myself, and I entreated him to allow me to go and dress her in the attire proper to her, so that her beauty might be seen to perfection, and that she might present herself before him with less embarrassment. He bade me go by all means, and said that the next day we should discuss the plan to be adopted for my return to Spain to carry away the hidden treasure. I saw Don Gaspar, I told him the danger he was in if he let it be seen that he was a man, I dressed him as a Moorish woman, and that same afternoon I brought him before the king, who was charmed when he saw him, and resolved to keep the damsel and make a present of her to the Grand Signor, and to avoid the risk she might run among the women of his seraglio, and distrustful of himself, he commanded her to be placed in the house of some Moorish ladies of rank who would protect and attend to her, and thither he was taken at once. What we both suffered, for I cannot deny that I love him, may be left to the imagination of those who are separated if they love one another dearly. The king then arranged that I should return to Spain in this brigantine, and that two Turks, those who killed your soldiers, should accompany me. There also came with me this Spanish renegade, and here she pointed to him who had first spoken, whom I know to be secretly a Christian, and to be more desirous of being left in Spain than of returning to Barbary. The rest of the crew of the brigantine are Moors and Turks, who merely serve as rowers. The two Turks, greedy and insolent, instead of obeying the orders we had to land me and this renegade in Christian dress, with which we came provided, on the first Spanish ground we came to, chose to run along the coast and make some prize if they could, fearing that if they put us ashore first, we might, in case of some accident befalling us, make it known that the brigantine was at sea, and thus, if there happened to be any galleys on the coast, they might be taken. We sighted this shore last night, and knowing nothing of these galleys, we were discovered, and the result was what you have seen. To sum up, there is Don Gregorio in woman's dress, among women, in imminent danger of his life, and here am I, with hands bound, in expectation, or rather in dread, of losing my life, of which I am already weary. Here, sirs, ends my sad story, as true as it is unhappy. All I ask of you is to allow me to die like a Christian, for, as I have already said, I am not to be charged with the offense of which those of my nation are guilty. And she stood silent, her eyes filled with moving tears, accompanied by plenty from the bystanders. The viceroy, touched with compassion, went up to her without speaking, and untied the cord that bound the hands of the Moorish girl. But all the while the Morisco Christian was telling her strange story, an elderly pilgrim, who had come on board of the galley at the same time as the viceroy, kept his eyes fixed upon her and the instant she ceased speaking, he threw himself at her feet, and embracing them said in a voice broken by sobs and sighs, O oh, Anna Felix, my unhappy daughter, I am thy father, Ricote, come back to look for thee, unable to live without thee, my soul that thou art. At these words of his, Sancho opened his eyes and raised his head, which he had been holding down, brooding over his unlucky excursion and looking at the pilgrim, he recognized in him that same ricote he met the day he quitted his government, and felt satisfied that this was his daughter. She, being now unbound, embraced her father, mingling her tears with his, while he, addressing the general and the viceroy, said, This, sirs, is my daughter, more unhappy in her adventures than in her name. She is Anna Felix, surnamed ricote, celebrated as much for her own beauty as for my wealth. I quitted my native land in search of some shelter or refuge for us abroad, 
and having found one in Germany, I returned in this pilgrim's dress, in the company of some other German pilgrims, to seek my daughter and take up a large quantity of treasure I had left buried. My daughter I did not find, the treasure I found and have with me, and now, in this strange roundabout way you have seen, I find the treasure that more than all makes me rich, my beloved daughter. If our innocence and her tears and mine can with strict justice open the door to clemency, extend it to us, for we never had any intention of injuring you, nor do we sympathize with the aims of our people, who have been justly banished. I know Ricote well, said Sancho at this, and I know too that what he says about Ana Felix being his daughter is true. But as to those other particulars about going and coming, and having good or bad intentions, I say nothing. While all present stood amazed at this strange occurrence, the general said, At any rate, your tears will not allow me to keep my oath. Live, fair Ana Felix, all the years that heaven has allotted you. But these rash insolent fellows must pay the penalty of the crime they have committed. And with that he gave orders to have the two Turks who had killed his two soldiers hanged at once at the yard arm. The viceroy, however, begged him earnestly not to hang them, as their behavior savored rather of madness than of bravado. The general yielded to the viceroy's request, for revenge is not easily taken in cold blood. They then tried to devise some scheme for rescuing Don Gaspar Gregorio from the danger in which he had been left. Ricote offered for that object more than two thousand ducats that he had in pearls and gems. They proposed several plans, but none so good as that suggested by the renegade already mentioned, who offered to return to Algiers in a small vessel of about six banks, manned by Christian rowers, as he knew where, how, and when he could and should land, nor was he ignorant of the house in which Don Gaspar was staying. The general and the viceroy had some hesitation about placing confidence in the renegade and entrusting him with the Christians who were to row, but Anna Felix said she could answer for him, and her father offered to go and pay the ransom of the Christian if by any chance they should not be forthcoming. This, then, being agreed upon, the viceroy landed, and Don Antonio Moreno took the fair Morisco and her father home with him, the viceroy charging him to give them the best reception and welcome in his power, while on his own part he offered all that house contained for their entertainment. So great was the goodwill and kindliness the beauty of Anna Felix had infused into his heart. Chapter 64 Treating of the adventure which gave Don Quixote more unhappiness than all that had hitherto befallen him. The wife of Don Antonio Moreno, so the history says, was extremely happy to see Ana Felix in her house. She welcomed her with great kindness, charmed as well by her beauty as by her intelligence, for in both respects the fair Morisco was richly endowed, and all the people of the city flocked to see her, as though they had been summoned by the ringing of the bells. Don Quixote told Don Antonio that the plan adopted for releasing Don Gregorio was not a good one, for its risks were greater than its advantages, and that it would be better to land himself with his arms and horse in Barbary, for he would carry him off in spite of the whole Moorish host, as Don Gaiferos carried off his wife Melisendra. Remember, your worship, observed Sancho on hearing him say so, Senor Don Gaiferos carried off his wife from the mainland, and took her to France by land. But in this case, if by chance we carry off Don Gregorio, we have no way of bringing him to Spain, for there's the sea between. There's a remedy for everything except death, said Don Quixote. If they bring the vessel close to the shore, we shall be able to get on board, though all the world strive to prevent us. Your worship hits it off mighty well and mighty easy, said Sancho, but it's a long step from saying to doing, and I hold to the renegade, for he seems to be an honest, good-hearted fellow. Don Antonio then said that if the renegade did not prove successful, the expedient of the great Don Quixote's expedition to Barbary should be adopted. Two days afterwards the renegade put to sea in a light vessel of six oars aside manned by a stout crew, and two days later the galleys made sail eastward, the general having begged the viceroy to let him know all about the release of Don Gregorio and about Ana Felix, and the viceroy promised to do as he requested. One morning, as Don Quixote went out for a stroll along the beach, arrayed in full armor, for, as he often said, that was his only gear, his only rest of fray, and he never was without it for a moment, he saw coming towards him a knight, also in full armor, with a shining moon painted on his shield, 
who, on approaching sufficiently near to be heard, said in a loud voice, addressing himself to Don Quixote, Illustrious knight, and never sufficiently extolled Don Quixote of La Mancha, I am the knight of the white moon, whose unheard of achievements will perhaps have recalled him to thy memory. I come to do battle with thee, and prove the might of thy arm, to the end that I make thee acknowledge and confess that my lady, let her be who she may, is incomparably fairer than thy Dulcinea del Toboso. If thou dost acknowledge this fairly and openly, thou shalt escape death, and save me the trouble of inflicting it upon thee. If thou fightest, and I vanquish thee, I demand no other satisfaction than that, laying aside arms and abstaining from going in quest of adventures, thou withdraw and betake thyself to thine own village for the space of a year, and live there without putting hand to sword, in peace and quiet and beneficial repose, the same being needful for the increase of thy substance and the salvation of thy soul. And if thou dost vanquish me, my head shall be at thy disposal, my arms and horse thy spoils, and the renown of my deeds transferred and added to thine. Consider which will be thy best course, and give me thy answer speedily, for this day is all the time I have for the dispatch of this business. Don Quixote was amazed and astonished, as well at the night of the white moon's arrogance, as at his reason for delivering the defiance, and with calm dignity he answered him, Knight of the white moon, of whose achievements I have never heard until now, I will venture to swear that you have never seen the illustrious Dulcinea, for had you seen her, I know you would have taken care not to venture yourself upon this issue, because the sight would have removed all doubt from your mind that there ever has been, nor can be, a beauty to be compared with hers. And so, not saying you lie, but merely that you are not correct in what you state, I accept your challenge, with the conditions you have proposed, and at once that the day you have fixed may not expire. And from your conditions I accept only that of the renown of your achievements being transferred to me, for I know not of what sort they are, nor what they may amount to. I am satisfied with my own, such as they be. Take, therefore, the side of the field you choose, and I will do the same and to whom God shall give it may St. Peter add his blessing. The knight of the white moon had been seen from the city, and it was told the viceroy how he was in conversation with Don Quixote. The viceroy, fancying it must be some fresh adventure got up by Don Antonio Moreno, or some other gentleman of the city, hurried out at once to the beach accompanied by Don Antonio and several other gentlemen, just as Don Quixote was wheeling Rocinante around in order to take up the necessary distance. The viceroy upon this, seeing that the pair of them were evidently preparing to come to the charge, put himself between them, asking them what it was that led them to engage in combat all of a sudden in this way. The knight of the white moon replied that it was a question of precedence of beauty, and briefly told him what he had said to Don Quixote, and how the conditions of the defiance agreed upon on both sides had been accepted. The viceroy went over to Don Antonio, and asked in a low voice did he know who the knight of the white moon was, or was it some joke they were playing on Don Quixote? Don Antonio replied that he neither knew who he was, nor whether the defiance was in joke or in earnest. This answer left the viceroy in a state of perplexity, not knowing whether he ought to let the combat go on or not. But unable to persuade himself that it was anything but a joke, he fell back, saying, if there be no other way out of it, gallant knights, except to confess or die, and Don Quixote is inflexible, and your worship of the white moon still more so, in God's hand be it, and fall on. He of the white moon thanked the viceroy in courteous and well-chosen words for the permission he gave them, and so did Don Quixote, who then, commending himself with all his heart to heaven and to his dulcinea, as was his custom on the eve of any combat that awaited him, proceeded to take a little more distance, as he saw his antagonist was doing the same. Then, without blast of trumpet or other warlike instrument to give them the signal to charge, both at the same instant wheeled their horses, and he of the white moon, being the swifter, met Don Quixote after having traversed two-thirds of the course, and there encountered him with such violence that, without touching him with his lance, for he held it high, to all appearance purposely, he hurled Don Quixote and Rocinante to the earth, a perilous fall. He sprang upon him at once, and placing the lance over his visor, said to him, You are vanquished, Sir Knight, nay, dead, unless you admit the conditions of our defiance. Don Quixote, bruised and stupefied, without raising his visor, said in a weak, feeble voice, as if he were speaking out of a tomb, 
Dulcinea del Toboso is the fairest woman in the world, and I the most unfortunate knight on earth. It is not fitting that this truth should suffer by my feebleness. Drive your lance home, sir knight, and take my life, since you have taken away my honor. That I will not, in sooth, said he of the white moon. Live the fame of the lady Dulcinea's beauty undimmed as ever. All I require is that the great Don Quixote retire to his own home for a year, or for so long a time as shall by me be enjoined upon him, as we agreed before engaging in this combat. The viceroy, Don Antonio, and several others who were present, heard all this, and heard too how Don Quixote replied, that so long as nothing in prejudice of Dulcinea was demanded of him, he would observe all the rest like a true and loyal knight. The engagement given, he of the white moon wheeled about, and making obeisance to the viceroy with a movement of the head, rode away into the city at a half-gallop. The viceroy bade Don Antonio hasten after him, and by some means or other find out who he was. They raised Don Quixote up and uncovered his face, and found him pale and bathed with sweat. Rocinante, from the mere hard measure he had received, lay unable to stir for the present. Sancho, wholly dejected and woebegone, knew not what to say or do. He fancied that all was a dream, that the whole business was a piece of enchantment. Here was his master defeated, and bound not to take up arms for a year. He saw the light of the glory of his achievements obscured. The hopes of the promises lately made him swept away like smoke before the wind. Rocinante, he feared, was crippled for life, and his master's bones out of joint. For if he were only shaken out of his madness, it would be no small luck. In the end they carried him into the city in a hand-chair, which the viceroy sent for, and thither the viceroy himself returned, eager to ascertain who this knight of the white moon was, who had left Don Quixote in such a sad plight. End of chapters 63 and 64five and sixty six of Don Quixote Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote Volume two by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by William Ormsby. Chapter sixty five. Wherein is made known who the Knight of the White Moon was, likewise Don Gregorio's release and other events. Don Antonio Moreno followed the knight of the white moon, and a number of boys followed him too, nay pursued him, until they had him fairly housed in a hostel in the heart of the city. Don Antonio, eager to make his acquaintance, entered also. A squire came out to meet him and remove his armor, and he shut himself into a lower room, still attended by Don Antonio, whose bread would not bake until he had found out who he was. He of the white moon, seeing then that the gentleman would not leave him, said, I know very well, senor, what you have come for. It is to find out who I am, and as there is no reason why I should conceal it from you, while my servant here is taking off my armor, I will tell you the true state of the case, without leaving out anything. You must know, senor, that I am called the bachelor Samson Carrasco. I am of the same village as Don Quixote of La Mancha, whose craze and folly make all of us who know him feel pity for him, and I am one of those who have felt it most and persuaded that his chance of recovery lay in quiet and keeping at home and in his own house, I hit upon a device for keeping him there. Three months ago, therefore, I went out to meet him as a knight-errant, under the assumed name of the Knight of the Mirrors, intending to engage him in combat and overcome him without hurting him, making it the condition of our combat that the vanquished should be at the disposal of the victor. What I meant to demand of him, for I regarded him as vanquished already, was that he should return to his own village, and not leave it for a whole year, by which time he might be cured. But fate ordered it otherwise, for he vanquished me and unhorsed me, and so my plan failed. He went his way, and I came back conquered, covered with shame, and sorely bruised by my fall, which was a particularly dangerous one. But this did not quench my desire to meet him again and overcome him, as you have seen to-day and as he is so scrupulous in his observance of the laws of knight-errantry, he will, no doubt, in order to keep his word, obey the injunction I have laid upon him. 
This, senor, is how the matter stands, and I have nothing more to tell you. I implore of you not to betray me or tell Don Quixote who I am, so that my honest endeavors may be successful, and that a man of excellent wits, were he only rid of the fooleries of chivalry, may get them back again. O oh, senor, said Don Antonio, may God forgive you the wrong you have done the whole world in trying to bring the most amusing madman in it back to his senses. Do you not see, senor, that the gain by Don Quixote's sanity can never equal the enjoyment his crazes give? But my belief is that all the senor bachelor's pains will be of no avail to bring a man so hopelessly cracked to his senses again, and if it were not uncharitable, I would say may Don Quixote never be cured, for by his recovery we lose not only his own drolleries, but his squire Sancho Panza's too, any one of which is enough to turn melancholy itself into merriment. However, I'll hold my peace and say nothing to him, and we'll see whether I am right in my suspicion that Señor Carrasco's efforts will be fruitless. The bachelor replied that at all events the affair promised well, and he hoped for a happy result from it and putting his services at Don Antonio's commands, he took his leave of him, and having had his armor packed at once upon a mule, he rode away from the city the same day, on the horse he rode to battle, and returned to his own country without meeting any adventure calling for record in this voracious history. Don Antonio reported to the viceroy what Carrasco told him, and the viceroy was not very well pleased to hear it, for with Don Quixote's retirement there was an end to the amusement of all who knew anything of his mad doings. Six days did Don Quixote keep his bed, dejected, melancholy, moody, and out of sorts, brooding over the unhappy event of his defeat. Sancho strove to comfort him, and among other things he said to him, Hold up your head, senor, and be of good cheer if you can, and give thanks to heaven that if you have had a tumble to the ground you have not come off with a broken rib, and as you know that where they give they take, and that there are not always fletches where there are pegs, a fig for the doctor, for there is no need of him to cure this ailment. Let us go home and give over going about in search of adventures in strange lands and places. Rightly looked at, it is I that am the greater loser, though it is your worship that has had the worse usage. With the government I gave up all wish to be a governor again, but I did not give up all longing to be a count and that will never come to pass if your worship gives up becoming a king by renouncing the calling of chivalry, and so my hopes are going to turn into smoke. Peace, Sancho, said Don Quixote, thou seest my suspension and retirement is not to exceed a year. I shall soon return to my honored calling, and I shall not be at a loss for a kingdom to win and a county to bestow on thee. May God hear it and sin be deaf, said Sancho, I have always heard say that a good hope is better than a bad holding. As they were talking, Don Antonio came in, looking extremely pleased and exclaiming, Reward me for my good news, Señor Don Quixote. Don Gregorio and the renegade who went for him have come ashore. Ashore, do I say? They are by this time in the viceroy's house, and will be here immediately. Don Quixote cheered up a little and said, of a truth I am almost ready to say I should have been glad had it turned out just the other way, for it would have obliged me to cross over to Barbary, where by the might of my arm I should have restored to liberty not only Don Gregorio, but all the Christian captives there are in Barbary. But what am I saying, miserable being that I am? Am I not he that has been conquered? Am I not he that has been overthrown? Am I not he who must not take up arms for a year? Then what am I making professions for? What am I bragging about? When it is fitter for me to handle the distaff than the sword? No more of that, senor, said Sancho. Let the hen live, even though it be with her pip. Today for thee, and tomorrow for me. In these affairs of encounters and wax one must not mind them, for he that falls today may get up tomorrow, unless indeed he chooses to lie in bed, I mean gives way to weakness and does not pluck up fresh spirit for fresh battles. Let your worship get up now to receive Don Gregorio, for the household seems to be in a bustle, and no doubt he has come by this time. And so it proved, for as soon as Don Gregorio and the renegade had given the viceroy an account of the voyage out and home, Don Gregorio, eager to see Ana Felix, came with the renegade to Don Antonio's house. When they carried him away from Algiers he was in woman's dress. On board the vessel, however, he exchanged it for that of a captive who escaped with him. 
but in whatever dress he might be he looked like one to be loved and served and esteemed, for he was surpassingly well favored, and to judge by appearances some seventeen or eighteen years of age. Ricote and his daughter came out to welcome him, the father with tears, the daughter with bashfulness. They did not embrace each other, for where there is deep love there will never be overmuch boldness. Seen side by side, the comeliness of Don Gregorio and the beauty of Ana Felix were the admiration of all who were present. It was silence that spoke for the lovers at that moment, and their eyes were the tongues that declared their pure and happy feelings. The renegade explained the measures and means he had adopted to rescue Don Gregorio, and Don Gregorio at no great length, but in a few words which he showed that his intelligence was in advance of his years, described the peril and embarrassment he found himself in among the women with whom he had sojourned. To conclude, Ricote liberally recompensed and rewarded as well the renegade as the men who had rowed, and the renegade effected his readmission into the body of the church, and was reconciled with it, and from a rotten limb became by penance and repentance a clean and sound one. Two days later the viceroy discussed with Don Antonio the steps they should take to enable Ana Felix and her father to stay in Spain, for it seemed to them there could be no objection to a daughter who was so good a Christian, and a father to all appearance so well disposed remaining there. Don Antonio offered to arrange the matter at the capital, whither he was compelled to go on some other business, hinting that many a difficult affair was settled there with the help of favor and bribes. Nay, said Ricote, who was present during the conversation, it will not do to rely upon favor or bribes, because with the great Don Bernardino de Velasco, Conde de Salazar, to whom his majesty has entrusted our expulsion, neither entreaties nor promises, bribes nor appeals to compassion, are of any use. For though it is true he mingles mercy with justice, still, seeing that the whole body of our nation is tainted and corrupt, he applies to it the cautery that burns rather than the salve that soothes, and thus, by prudence, sagacity, care, and the fear he inspires, he has borne on his mighty shoulders the weight of this great policy, and carried it into effect, all our schemes and plots, importunities and wiles, being ineffectual to blind his argus eyes, ever on the watch lest one of us should remain behind in concealment, and like a hidden root come in course of time to sprout and bear poisonous fruit in Spain, now cleansed and relieved of the fear in which our vast numbers kept it. Heroic resolve of the great Philip the Third, and unparalleled wisdom to have entrusted it to the said Don Bernardo de Velasco. At any rate, said Don Antonio, when I am there I will make all possible efforts, and let heaven do as pleases it best. Don Gregorio will come with me to relieve the anxiety which his parents must be suffering on account of his absence. Ana Felix will remain in my house with my wife, or in a monastery, and I know the viceroy will be glad that the worthy Bricote should stay with him until we see what terms I can make. The viceroy agreed to all that was proposed, but Don Gregorio, on learning what had passed, declared that he could not and would not on any account leave Ana Felix. However, as it was his purpose to go and see his parents and devise some way of returning for her, he fell in with the proposed arrangement. Ana Felix remained with Don Antonio's wife and Ricote in the viceroy's house. The day for Don Antonio's departure came, and two days later that for Don Quixote's and Sancho's, for Don Quixote's fall did not suffer him to take the road sooner. There were tears and sighs, swoonings and sobs, at the parting between Don Gregorio and Ana Felix. Ricote offered Don Gregorio a thousand crowns if he would have them, but he would not take any save five which Don Antonio lent him, and he promised to repay at the capital. So the two of them took their departure, and Don Quixote and Sancho afterwards, as has been already said, Don Quixote without his armor and in traveling gear, and Sancho on foot, Dapple being loaded with the armor. Chapter 66 Which treats of what he who reads will see, or what he who has read to him will hear. As he left Barcelona, Don Quixote turned gaze upon the spot where he had fallen. Here Troy was, said he, here my ill luck, not my cowardice, robbed me of all the glory I had won. Here fortune made me the victim of her caprices. Here the luster of my achievements was dimmed. Here, in a word, fell my happiness never to rise again. Senor, said Sancho on hearing this, it is the part of brave hearts to be patient in adversity just as much as to be glad in prosperity. I judge by myself, for if when I was a governor I was glad, 
Now that I am a squire and on foot I am not sad, and I have heard say that she whom commonly they call fortune is a drunken whimsical jade, and what is more, blind, and therefore neither sees what she does, nor knows whom she casts down or whom she sets up. Thou art a great philosopher, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Thou speakest very sensibly. I know not who taught thee, but I can tell thee there is no such thing as fortune in the world, nor does anything which takes place there, be it good or bad, come about by chance, but by the special preordination of heaven, and hence the common saying that each of us is the maker of his own fortune. I have been that of mine, but not with the proper amount of prudence, and my self-confidence has therefore made me pay dearly, for I ought to have reflected that Rocinante's feeble strength could not resist the mighty bulk of the knight of the white moon's horse. In a word, I ventured it, I did my best, I was overthrown, but though I lost my honor, I did not lose, nor can I lose, the virtue of keeping my word. When I was a knight-errant, daring and valiant, I supported my achievements by hand and deed, and now that I am a humble squire, I will support my words by keeping the promise I have given. Forward then, Sancho, my friend, let us go to keep the year of the Novitate in our own country, and in that seclusion we shall pick up fresh strength to return to the by me never forgotten calling of arms. Senor, returned Sancho, traveling on foot is not such a pleasant thing that it makes me feel disposed or tempted to make long marches. Let us leave this armor hung up on some tree, instead of some one that has been hanged, and then with me on Dapple's back and my feet off the ground, we will arrange the stages as your worship pleases to measure them out. But to suppose that I am going to travel on foot and make long ones is to suppose nonsense. Thou sayest well, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Let my armor be hung up for a trophy, and under it or round it we will carve on the trees what was inscribed on the trophy of Roland's armor, these let none move, who dareth not his might with Roland prove. That's the very thing, said Sancho, and if it was not that we should feel the want of Rocinante on the road, it would be as well to leave him hung up too. And yet I had rather not have either him or the armor hung up, said Don Quixote, that it may not be said, for good service a bad return. Your worship is right, said Sancho, for, as sensible people hold, the fault of the ass must not be laid on the pack-saddle, and, as in this affair the fault is your worship's, punish yourself and don't let your anger break out against the already battered and bloody armor, or the meekness of Rocinante, or the tenderness of my feet, trying to make them travel more than is reasonable. In converse of this sort the whole of that day went by, as did the four succeeding ones, without anything occurring to interrupt their journey, but on the fifth, as they entered a village, they found a great number of people at the door of an inn enjoying themselves, as it was a holiday. Upon Don Quixote's approach, a peasant called out, One of these two gentlemen who come here, and who don't know the parties, will tell us what we ought to do about our wager. That I will, certainly, said Don Quixote, and according to the rights of the case, if I can manage to understand it. Well, here it is, worthy sir, said the peasant. A man of this village who is so fat that he weighs twenty stone challenged another, a neighbor of his, who does not weigh more than nine, to run a race. The agreement was that they were to run a distance of a hundred paces with equal weights, and when the challenger was asked how the weights were to be equalized, he said that the other, as he weighed nine stone, should put eleven in iron on his back, and that in this way the twenty stone of the thin man would equal the twenty stone of the fat one. Not at all, exclaimed Sancho at once, before Don Quixote could answer. It's for me, that only a few days ago left off being a governor and a judge, as all the world knows, to settle these doubtful questions and give an opinion in disputes of all sorts. Answer in God's name, Sancho, my friend, said Don Quixote, for I am not fit to give crumbs to a cat, my wits are so confused and upset. With this permission, Sancho said to the peasants who stood clustered round him, waiting with open mouths for the decision to come from his, Brothers, what the fat man requires is not in reason, nor has it a shadow of justice in it, because if it be true, as they say, that the challenged may choose the weapons, the other has no right to choose such as will prevent and keep him from winning. My decision, therefore, is that the fat challenger prune, peel, thin, trim, and correct himself, and take eleven stone of his flesh off his body, here or there, as he pleases, and as suits him best and being in this way reduced to nine stone weight, he will make himself equal and even with nine stone of his opponent, and they will be able to run on equal terms. 
By all that's good, said one of the peasants, as he heard Sancho's decision, but the gentleman has spoken like a saint, and given judgment like a canon. But I'll be bound the fat man won't part with an ounce of his flesh, not to say eleven stone. The best plan will be for them not to run, said another, so that neither the thin man break down under the weight, nor the fat one strip himself of his flesh. Let half the wager be spent in wine, and let's take these gentlemen to the tavern where there's the best, and over me be the cloak when it rains. I thank you, sirs, said Don Quixote, but I cannot stop for an instant, for sad thoughts and unhappy circumstances force me to seem discourteous and to travel apace. And spurring Rocinante he pushed on, leaving them wondering at what they had seen and heard, at his own strange figure and at the shrewdness of his servant, for such they took Sancho to be. And another of them observed, If the servant is so clever, what must the master be? I'll bet, if they are going to Salamanca to study, they'll come to the alcaldes of the court in a trice, for it's a mere joke, only to read and read and have interest and good luck, and before a man knows where he is, finds himself with a staff in his hand or a mitre on his head. That night master and man passed out in the fields in the open air, and the next day as they were pursuing their journey, they saw coming towards them a man on foot, with alforjas at the neck and a javelin or spiked staff in his hand, the very cut of a foot courier, who, as soon as he came close to Don Quixote, increased his pace and half running came up to him, and embracing his right thigh, for he could reach no higher, exclaimed with evident pleasure, O oh, Señor Don Quixote of La Mancha, what happiness it will be to the heart of my lord the duke, when he knows your worship is coming back to his castle, for he is still there with my lady the duchess. I do not recognize you, friend, said Don Quixote, nor do I know who you are, unless you tell me. I am Tosilos, my lord the duke's lackey, Señor Don Quixote, replied the courier, he who refused to fight your worship about marrying the daughter of Doña Rodriguez. God bless me, exclaimed Don Quixote, is it possible that you are the one whom mine enemies the enchanters changed into the lackey you speak of, in order to rob me of the honor of that battle? Nonsense, good sir, said the messenger, there was no enchantment or transformation at all. I entered the lists just as much lackey Tosilos as I came out of them lackey Tosilos. I thought to marry without fighting, for the girl had taken my fancy. But my scheme had a very different result, for as soon as your worship had left the castle, my lord the duke had a hundred strokes of the stick given me for having acted contrary to the orders he gave me before engaging in the combat. And the end of the whole affair is that the girl has become a nun, and Doña Rodriguez has gone back to Castile, and I am now on my way to Barcelona with a packet of letters for the viceroy, which my master is sending him. If your worship would like a drop, sound though warm, I have a gourd here full of the best, and some scraps of tranchant cheese that will serve as a provocative and wakener of your thirst, if so be it is asleep. I take the offer, said Sancho, no more compliments about it. Pour out, good Tosilos, in spite of all the enchanters in the Indies. Thou art indeed the greatest glutton in the world, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and the greatest booby on earth, not to be able to see that this courier is enchanted, and this Tosilos a sham one. Stop with him and take thy fill. I will go on slowly and wait for thee to come up with me. The lackey laughed, unsheathed his gourd, unwalleted his scraps, and taking out a small loaf of bread, he and Sancho seated themselves on the green grass, and in peace and good fellowship finished off the contents of the alforjas down to the bottom, so resolutely that they licked the wrapper of the letters, merely because it smelt of cheese. Said Tosilos to Sancho, Beyond a doubt, Sancho, my friend, this master of thine ought to be a madman. Ought, said Sancho, he owes no man anything. He pays for everything, particularly when the coin is madness. I see it plain enough, and I tell him so plain enough. But what's the use, especially now that it is all over with him, for here he is beaten by the knight of the white moon? Tosilos begged him to explain what had happened him, but Sancho replied that it would not be good manners to leave his master waiting for him, and that some other day, if they met, there would be time enough for that. And then getting up, after shaking his doublet and brushing the crumbs out of his beard, he drove Dapple on before him, and bidding adieu to Tosilos, left him and rejoined his master, who was waiting for him under the shade of a tree. End of chapter 66